Um, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter 7. Uh, or uh, if you're in the blue Bibles in the seats, it's page 818. If you're in the scripture journals that are in the seats, it's on page 44 and 46. And I uh, hope you'll grab one of those and follow along uh, with us as we go today. Um, as we get started, uh, I want to remind you just where we left off last week in chapter, uh, in chapter 7. So at the beginning of chapter 7, we see Jesus engaging with uh, these people who are very uh, well-to-do, high-ranking Jewish uh, religious leaders um, that, uh, that he's drawing attention from. All the things Jesus has been doing through the book of Mark is drawing a lot of attention um, to him. And so he's getting some attention from really, really big name guys, and uh, they're coming and asking him questions, and that was what we talked about last week, is how Jesus dealt with their questions and dealt with the idea of purity and, uh, and what defiles a person, and that it's our hearts that we have to get right, not just the, the, um, the, the following the law. Uh, but it's our hearts that really have to become in line with God's desire and God's will. And, uh, and so today we continue uh, kind of from that perspective. Uh, we're going to see what happens next in verse 24. It says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Okay? So before we go any further, all right, uh, Jesus gets up, he wakes up, and he says, All right, we're going to leave this place where all these people have come uh, to see me and where I have, like, all these people who are, are like, drawing attention to me, and we're going to move into a, a different place where things can be a little bit more quiet, and I don't want anyone to know what's going on. I don't want anyone to know where I'm at. Now, this isn't because Jesus is like antisocial or he's an introvert or any of those other kinds of things. This is because Jesus honestly is trying to protect his ministry. As word grows and gets out about Jesus, there becomes a lot of complicated issues that are at play with Jews and Romans, okay? So if, if, if Jesus are, is taken by force by either group for any reason, um, his ministry stops and is halted before he's ready for it to be stopped and halted. And so he does not want that to happen, so he withdraws from the place where he's getting a lot of attention to a place where he's going to be far less noticeable. That's the, the point here, okay? Um, but verse 24 ends with, yet he could not be hidden, okay? So like no matter where Jesus went, he could not actually stay covert even though he was trying. And verse 25 says, but immediately, our favorite word in the book of Mark, immediately, there's something getting ready to happen. That's what it immediately points to. It says, a woman whose little daughter had been, or who had had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, uh, I want to just stop and camp out there for just a second. So we have this woman. She hears about Jesus immediately. She gets up from wherever she is, and she runs to Jesus, gets down uh, at his feet, and she tells Jesus this story about her daughter who's demon-possessed and how she is desiring healing. And Jesus' response is, let me first feed the children, uh, and I don't want to throw the food to dogs. Now, <laughs> If you're reading that, you might, like, when you read something like that from Jesus, your eyes might go, oh, oh, well, Jesus just going to call somebody a dog like that. All right. Um, you know, it, 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 can, it can throw us for a loop a little bit, and it can seem like Jesus is being insensitive or he's being rude or he's being uh, demeaning towards someone. Uh, but I want to explain the idea behind this comment and what this actually means uh, because it's, it's really important given the context of what happens next. Now, um, in, in, in this time and at this age, uh, Jews used this word to refer to Gentiles as dogs. It was a slang word for Gentiles, which essentially meant dog. And what they were basically saying is they're animals. They're not, you're not trying, he's not calling this woman a B word. He's not, uh, you know, like 
making some sort of racial slur or anything like that. He's just, he's just using a term that Jews would have used to describe Gentiles because of their animalistic behavior. The way they live their life uh, was giving into their, their worldly flesh passions and desires a lot like animals, right? Animals, like they see meat, they go after it. Does that make sense? Like they, ha- they, they don't know how to control their most animalistic tendencies and desires. And this is what Paul talks about all throughout the New Testament when he says we must, we, we must put off the sinful desires of our flesh. He says you once walked in this way, but you shouldn't walk in this way anymore. This is what he's referring to. He's referring to this idea uh, that Eugene Peterson calls um, the, the corruption that sin has introduced into the very um, appetite and instincts of us as human beings. So our appetites and our instincts go from where God had created them to be as image bearers of him when we were created to become more animalistic. And, and so he sets apart this group of people, the Jews, and he gives them a law to abide by. And the whole point is, I'm trying to help you be the human beings that you are intended to be. We couldn't do that. No one could do that. And so Jesus has to show up and be the human that we couldn't be. And, and so when he says this, all he's saying is, here, here is someone who is identified with a group of people who, who is known for um, just giving in to their passions and desires and not trying to be set apart for God and his purposes and his will. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so animals uh, behave um, different than human beings. That's the idea here uh, of why Gentiles are called dogs. Now, um, her response is deeply profound and deeply fitting and what I really want to draw in on today. Because she says in verse 28, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Any of you have dogs? Any of you have children? Okay, so I, I, I have both. Well, I had both. Let me say that. My wife got rid of our dogs. Um, so uh, we had dogs at one point, and for all you dog lovers, it wasn't because we don't love our dogs. It's because I have allergies, and she loved me more than she loved the dogs. And, uh, and I woke up about near death almost every day uh, when, you know, because they slept in our bed. It was, it was a whole thing. Anyway, uh, so... <laughs> the, the deal, the deal was uh, that I used, to ha- I used to have dogs, and I had kids, and every night at mealtime, my, my dogs would run underneath whatever child happened to be in the high chair at that moment, because we have a lot of kids. And, and, they, and they just sat there waiting for things to fall from the high chair. You know what I'm talking about? So we understand this idea. That's what dogs do, right? Now... There's a, there is a reality to say that animals behave like animals, but what that also means is that, like in this case, dogs, they, they, they know where their meal comes from. They know who's going to feed them. It's the human beings who are going to feed them. And so her saying this is her confessing and her declaring, yes, I know, but because I'm, but you can call me a dog all you want, but, but that also means I know where my next meal comes from. That, that means I know where, where I'm gonna get what I most need. And where I'm gonna get what I most need is at your table. It is this beautiful, beautiful response to say, yes, call me whatever you wanna call me. But that means this as much as it means that. As, it, as much as it means that I am, I am, I might, I might, I might not live the life that I should live, it, it also means that I know where to be if I want my next meal. And it's just this beautiful, humble thing. And think something that I notice about her in this story is I notice that she's in this space and she's in this place where she understands that her proximity to Jesus really matters because it's her proximity to Jesus where she's going to get what she most needs and what she most desires. 
We, we have to realize this as, as people. We have to get to a place, and there will come a time, and there will come a time in all of our lives when we come up against something that we will not be able to handle on our own. And I want you to remember this story, and I want you to respond the way that this woman responds. I want you to run to the master's table and just wait for a crumb. Because... It is, it is her proximity to him that even makes this possible. Now, she goes close to him, and then she, she holds on to this humble perspective. She's on her knees. She's bowed low. She is in a humble position, in a humble state, and she is just willing to take whatever scraps might fall her way because she is hungry for something. And that's something that we should all pay attention to. Some of us, we've lost our hunger and our thirst for God. And we've lost our hunger and our thirst for what he can do in our life. And we've become apathetic and we've just given up hope. We've given in to despair. And, and this is, we always have to stay humble and we always have to stay hungry for more and more of God. And what he can do in our life. And knowing that he is the only one who can do what needs to be done. And because she has this position and because she is in this proximity to Jesus, he works and moves in her life. And uh, and he says this in verse 29. He says, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child lying in bed, demon gone. Man, if you, are, if you are up against something like that, whatever it might be, may you just find yourself this morning running to the Father, running to the Master's table, and just asking Him, God, will you do this work in my life? I need you to do something in me. I need you to, I need you to transform this relationship. I need you to transform this situation. I need you to work and, and move um, and and because I, I can't do it myself, and then just wait there while the crumbs fall, and those little small crumbs do more in your life than you trying to make the greatest meal you've ever made. You know what I mean? On your own, it's just such a beautiful thing. Verse thirty-one moves on. Jesus then returned. From the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Now, uh, so we've been to the Decapolis before. If you've been with us for any period of time, just a few uh, weeks ago, we were in the Decapolis, uh, and uh, is at the beginning of chapter five. All right, the Decapolis it just means uh, region of ten cities uh, or area of ten cities, and so that's what the word means. And last time we were in the Decapolis, Jesus showed up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and there was this demon possessed man hanging out amongst the tombs. You guys remember this? And Jesus, he cr- comes up to Jesus, falls down at his feet, cries out, Jesus, don't torment us, all this stuff. And Jesus sends the demons into the pigs, and they run off the cliff, and we had barbecue that day. Y'all remember that, yeah? All right, so here's, here's the deal. Like, the, Jesus has been to this place before, okay? Um, and, he, and he's had an interaction with, with a few people, and it, he left with mixed reviews, okay? Let's just say that. He left with mixed reviews. But in verse 32, look at this. It says, And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. So in chapter 5, Jesus shows up in the Decapolis, and he heals this guy who's possessed by demons and sends the pigs down into the sea, and it's a whole thing, and it scares the living daylights out of all the people in the Decapolis, and they run up to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, please leave now. Like, get in your boat and go wherever you want to go, but get there as fast as possible because we don't want to have anything to do with you. He scared them to death. Now, I want you to remember that between the beginning of five and now, we're probably like a year to a year and a half down the road. So we're like 12 to 18 months down the road. (laughs) And Jesus shows back up, and now people run up to him, and they're asking him for stuff. And 
It's interesting to me because at the end of that story in chapter 5, there's this guy that's just been healed by, uh, from, from demon possession, and he wants to go with Jesus. Like Jesus gets in the boat with his disciples and heads back to do ministry um, in other places, and, and this guy's like, I want to go with you, and Jesus says, no, no, go and tell of what God has done for you. Now, the interesting thing about that is that's the only person in the book of Mark that Jesus says, go and tell what God's done for you. Most of the other ones, he's like, you know, be quiet. Don't say anything, right? But this is a Gentile region where there are a lot of Gentiles who live there and who don't know Jesus, who don't know God, don't have a relationship with God. And so he tells this guy who's just been released from demon possession to go and tell people the good news of the gospel. And he becomes the first apostle to the Gentiles. And we think of Paul as the first apostle to the Gentiles. That, that happens in Acts chapter 9, right? He has this road to Damascus experience. And, he, and it says that I am setting him apart as my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles. That's what the Bible says in Acts 9. Now, um, but, but in this situation right here, the word apostle just means one who is sent. Jesus sends this guy into the Decapolis and he starts talking about Jesus and all Jesus has done for him and the gospel starts to prov like prevail in this area to the point that when Jesus shows up again, 12 to 18 months later, people are running to Jesus for help. It is this beautiful, beautiful picture of what God can do if we listen to what he calls us to do. And we are, are on the, the, the backside of the resurrection and of the Great Commission where Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. He tells us to go in and share the gospel, share the good news with anybody and everybody who will listen. Because there are people who need to hear it. And when Jesus comes back, <laughs> those are the people who are going to run toward him. But there is, a, there is a responsibility that we have in the meantime, until he returns, that we go and share that gospel and see whose life it might change and might transform. It's a really, really, just in a couple verses, if you just know the context of what's going on here, it's a really powerful change in this, in this region. It's a really powerful change in the Decapolis. Verse 33 says, he takes this man aside from the crowd privately, and he put his fingers in his ears. Can you guys believe this? Like, Jesus is, like, putting his fingers in his ears. Like, just weird stuff, man. <laughs> and after spitting, he touched his tongue. I don't know if he spit on his hand and touched his tongue. Did he spit on his tongue and touch his tongue? I don't know. Just spit? Did he spit? I don't know. Like, these details are just crazy to me. Like, when I'm reading this, I'm just like, why do you got to put that in there? You don't got to put that in there. Um, <laughs> he touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Afafatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged him to tell no one. <laughs> But the more he charged them, the more zealous they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So <laughs> Jesus encounters this guy, can't speak and he can't hear. And he sees this as a perfect opportunity, a perfect opportunity to, to uh, enact and live out something that's been prophesied in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 35, um, it, in verses 5 and 6, it says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now, a lot of times when we read something like that and we read about a miracle about someone's, you know, he, he's no longer deaf. He was deaf and now he's not. He was mute and now he's speaking. We, we really get fascinated with the miracle. And the miracle is great, right? 
I mean, none of us would say like, oh, wow, that guy couldn't hear a minute ago and now he can. That's not special, right? Like we're, we're like, that, yeah, that's great. But the problem is it's so great. Sometimes we make it about the miracle and not about what the miracle points to. And Jesus does this miracle because he's pointing to this passage right here. He is hyperlinking by his action this passage that's found in Isaiah 35. And when he, he hyperlinks Isaiah 35, he then is hyperlinking what Isaiah 35 is hyperlinking, which is Genesis chapter 1. Because he goes into, uh, in verse 6, he says, Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. You guys know, I, I've talked about this before, but in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. The, the Hebrew phrase is tovu vavohu, all right? Say that out loud because it's fun. Tovu vavohu, yeah? You guys didn't say it. All right, let's try again. Ready? Tovu vavohu, all right? It means wild and waste, all right? It is, it is the, de, the, the, the definition of wilderness. It is the definition of, uh, of, of just unformed chaos. And God is going to go into that unformed chaos and he is going to create order. And out of that chaos, he is going to bring life. And the ways in which he's gonna bring life is he's gonna bring streams of living water into the wilderness and into this wild and wasteland of a desert. And so this is a poetic way in Isaiah 35 to point back to Genesis 1 to God's creation. And so when Jesus does this, when he uh, allows the deaf to hear and the mute to speak, what he's doing is he's pointing forward not to an old creation, but to a new creation. He's pointing us forward to a time when all things are being made new. He's pointing us to a time where whether you are, are less than human because of your deformity or you are less than human because of your sin, he is making you new. And he is restoring to you your identity as an image bearer of God so that you might be an instrument to bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. He is in the process of remaking and restoring all of us into something that we have all been intended to be since the very beginning. You might not be deaf and you might not be mute, but I think God wants to touch your life in such a way that you will never be the same and that you will reflect his image. The human beings that you were called and created to be so that his name and his renown can make its way to anywhere and everywhere. And so I hope that when we, when we see things like that, we don't just get fascinated with the miracle. And when God does something in our life, we don't just get fascinated with the miracle, but we get fascinated with the fact that he's changing us, that he's transforming us, that he's making us new for the sake of the world and for the sake of others. If God changes your life, um, maybe, maybe that makes your life better. But, but if God changes your life, what I know it will make better is everybody else's interaction with you. If God can change the life of a father, he can change the life of children. And if he can change the life of a mom, he can change the life of, of children. And if he can change the life of, a, of an employee, he can change the, the life of people in an office. And if he can change the life of a student, he can change the lives of people in a school. The reality is, is that God changes us, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others. 
that we are being formed into his image, into his human beings for the sake of others. This is not a selfish endeavor to try and become like Jesus. Because if we are like Jesus, we will bless the world. And that is why we go after it. That is why we long for it and desire it more than anything else. And we ask God, do a miracle in my life and make me new. That I might point to your good and beautiful new creation, a new Jerusalem where there is no more pain and suffering, but there only is hope and life in Christ. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning, and thank you for just the chance that we have to be here. Thank you for um, your word and these powerful, powerful stories of your goodness and your grace. God, I pray that you might touch us today, that you might transform us, that you might take something in us that is broken and restore it. That we might know the healing of this girl who was possessed by a demon, but was set free. God, I pray that we might know what it's like to, to feel like we can't hear your voice above the noise. God, I pray we'll hear it clearly today. That you'll open our ears. God, that, that, that we may be blind to what you want to do in our life. God, I pray you'll open our eyes. God, that we might not know what to say or how to speak. God, I pray that you'll speak on our behalf and open our lips. God, we just want to be more like you. And we want to bring your kingdom here. And so, God, do something in us that might change not just our life, but, but change the lives of everyone we touch and come in contact with. Keep us humble and hungry for more of you, even if it's just a crumb that falls from your table. God, that is a more powerful, more sustaining meal than anything we can conjure up on our own. And so, God, may we just find ourselves humble at your feet, Asking and praying, hoping for just a crumb. We love you. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.